Hello and welcome to the session. This is Professor Farhat. In this session, we're going to be looking at IAS 16, which deals with property, plant, and equipment. This topic is covered in an international accounting course, as well as the CPA exam. Yes, this covered. This topic is covered on the exam. Before I start, I would always like to remind my viewers to connect with me on a professional level via LinkedIn account. If you don't have a LinkedIn account, I strongly should suggest you create one. It's very important for your professional image and network ability. YouTube is where I house all my lectures. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube, please do so. Please like my lectures if you like them. Put them in playlist, share them, let the world know about them. If you're benefiting from my lectures, or somebody else might benefit as well. Please share the wealth. This is my Instagram account. I'm trying to grow my Instagram account. Please follow me on Instagram. This is my Facebook page. I do have some premium account on Gumroad and this is my website. Let's go ahead and talk about IAS 16, property, plant and equipment. So this, this standard was adopted in 1993, although many of its central statement provisions had been part of the IAS since the 1970s. So nothing have changed uh, since the 70s, but it was formally adopted. Okay, so IAS 16 covers the following accounting when it comes to fixed asset and this is what we're going to be looking at recognition of initial cost of property plant and equipment basically when we initially buy the asset how do we record the asset initially recognition of subsequent cost well when we incur additional costs how do we have to de deal with that measurement at initial recognition what dollar amount do we state the asset at the initial recognition measurement after initial recognition and this is going to be very interesting because as far as U.S. GAAP, we don't practically we don't have anything to deal with after initial recognition, except if we had to do impairment. But otherwise, we don't have to worry about it. We uh, depreciation as well as derecognition. What's derecognition is when you sell or retire the asset or exchange it, something to that effect. So those are the topics, the main topics that IAS 16 deal with. So let's start with recognition of initial cost. Okay, what does the cost include? Obviously, the cost would include what you're going to pay for this asset, the purchase price. The purchase price would include import duties and any, any taxes you have to pay. For example, if you wanted to buy a car, let's assume you wanted to buy a car from Germany. Well, it's a Mercedes. You have to pay $60,000 for the Mercedes. Then to bring it to the US, you might have to pay $5,000 in import duties. Who knows? It might be more if the president imposed tariffs. Then you might have to pay certain taxes, maybe taxes on the vehicle in your state to register that vehicle. So all of those are part of your cost. Okay. So practically all costs needed for an asset to perform as intended. So what, so, so any cost you need to incur to get this asset ready for its intended use, whatever that intended use is, transportation, insurance while in transit, any cost you have to include as part of your cost. Also, what you have to do, if you have any dismantling cost, estimate the cost of dismantling and removing the asset along with with res restoring the site. So let's assume you're gonna you're gonna be building an asset, okay? And after 10 to 15 years, you have to remove you have to remove this asset, okay? You have to remove the building and restore the land by law to its original, maybe plant some trees, whatever the or plant grass, whatever the original. Um, condition of the land. Well, guess what? You have to estimate the cost of dismantling and removing uh, the asset along with the restoration site. Okay. If you exchange an asset, if you exchange an asset, the fair value is used unless no commercial substance or fair value cannot be determined. Now, I am not going to cover the exchange of assets here uh, in details because this is this course is basically an overview. But if you're interested in looking a little bit more about when two assets are exchanged, whether there's a commercial substance, no commercial substance, fair value is known or unknown, go to my intermediate accounting lessons. Just want to let you know that sometimes you can you can you can acquire an asset through an exchange and simply put what I'm going to tell you here, you would record this asset based on the fair value of the asset that you gave up. Unless it lacks commercial substance, you have to deal with a different rule or the fair value cannot be determined. Under those circumstances, you would have to use the book value to record the initial recognition of the asset. Okay, that's all what I'm going to say about this. Well, let's take a look at an example just to see how this all fits together. Um, T Corporation construct a powder coating facility at a cost of $3 million 
1 million for the building and 2 million for the machinery and equipment. So there's $3 million cost. 1 million is going to be allocated to the building, 2 million for the machinery. Local law requires the company to dismantle and remove the plant at the end of its useful life. So notice here we have an additional requirement because once you are done with that powder coating facility, you have to uh, dismantle and remove the building. Now what's going to happen, the company will have to estimate the net cost of removal of the equipment after the duct and salvage value. It will be 100000 and the and the net cost for dismantling and removing the building will be 400000 So with the equipment, it's going to cost them 100000 to remove it, and the building, it's going to cost them 400000 to remove it. Okay? The useful life of this facility is 20 years. Now, they don't have to worry about this $100,000 or this $400,000 until 20 years later. Why? Because they're going to estimate how much they have to incur 20 years later. They're going to be using a discount rate of 10%. Now, if you don't know how to do present value computation, if you don't know how to do present value or discounting, if you don't know this concept, because we're going to be working with this, by all means, go to my intermediate accounting chapter six. I have a detailed explanation from A to Z about the present value. Otherwise, here I'm going to assume you know how to deal with present value. Okay, so how do we record this asset, which is the building and the machinery initially? Okay, so the initial cost of the machinery and equipment must include the estimated dismantling and removal cost discounted to the present value. Well, the 100,000, we don't have to kind of record it as 100,000 because we don't have to pay it today. We have to pay it 20 years from now. The 400,000, the same concept. So it's additional cost that we have to incur. But fortunately, fortunately, we don't have to come up with that money until 20 years later. And we are assuming a 10% rate. What does that mean? It means for the uh, for the construction cost of the building for the construction cost it's going to be a million dollar so our cost will be a million dollar oops it will be let me erase this the construction cost for the building will be a million dollar what we pay today plus the present value of 100 uh, yeah actually for the building is 400 plus the present value of $400,000. This will be the cost of the building. Uh, the building For the machinery, it will be $2 million plus the present value of the $100,000. So this is how we come up with the cost of each. So the construction cost of the building is $1 million plus the present value of dismantling and removing, which is it's going to cost us $400,000, discounted at the present value factor, 0.14864. Once again, if you don't know what, what, what's going on here, go to my intermediate accounting chapter six. So the present value is 59,457. Therefore, the building will be debited. We add the building at a million fifty nine thousand four fifty seven. The same concept would apply to the machinery and equipment. The cost is two million plus the present value of the smental net, which is we have to come up with $100,000, but 20 years from now, therefore we have to account for 14,864. Therefore, the cost of the machine is 2,014,864. So notice those two numbers, I'm gonna highlight them in yellow. Those two numbers here, the 59,457 and the 14,864, those are future liability, okay? And when you have a liability, you have to incur expenses interest expense, right? But now you have to record the liability. Let's take a look at the entry. The entry will be debit the building, 1,059,000, debit the machinery, 2,014,864, credit cash, the only cash we're coming up with today is 3 million, and provision for dismantling and removing, which is a liability of 74,000. Now what's gonna happen is this, from now till 20 years from now, this liability will incur interest. So every year, of starting with year one, year 174,321. This is the liability. This liability would incur interest at 10%. And that's 7,400, 432 dollars and 10 cent. What's gonna happen? This amount will be added to the liability and it will be an interest expense. Then the liability for the following year will be this number, which is 74,321 plus $7,432.10. This will be our new liability. Then we multiply it by 10%. 
we debit interest expense credit provision for dismantling and removing and after 20 years this account here will be half a million which is 100,000 and 400,000 if you'd like to try it you can try it for 20 years just to kind of go over the computation to prove it to yourself okay measurement subsequent to initial recognition so we looked at the asset we looked at the initial recognition now we're going to be looking at subsequent recognition subsequent recognition so the IFRS, which is in contrast to U.S. GAAP, allows two treatment. And this is a major issue between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. The first method is the cost method, which is just, just you record it at cost and you depreciate the asset. The second method is revaluation method. And this is not acceptable under U.S. GAAP. U.S. GAAP does not use the revaluation method. So what you have to do, the fair value date of the revaluation mi minus subsequent depreciation. So what you have to do is you have to revalue at fair value your assets. Okay? Must revalue entire class of assets. So when you do this revaluation, it, it applies to the entire class. You cannot select. What is, what is an entire class? You might have land land and building, machinery, office equipment, furniture and fixture, motor vehicles, ships and aircraft. Those are different uh, classes. You must also provide detailed disclosure for each class. Whether you revalue it or not, you still have to provide the detail. And you must, you might have to revalue often, okay? Now this is important. The increase in value go to other comprehensive income. So let's assume you have a piece of land or a piece of equipment and a, a building, it went up in value. The increase in value goes into OCI. Then the decrease reduces OCI. So if, let's assume you bought a building for 100,000. The value went up, goes into OCI. Then if the value goes down, it goes down from OCI until you reach 100,000. Once it falls below OCI, but once it falls below 100,000, 100,000 is cost, it becomes an expense then it becomes an expense so the 100,000 basically is your line any accounting that's done above the 100,000 any increase or decrease it's in, into OCI and once the revaluation falls below 100,000 which is below the original cost then it's considered an expense it hits the income statement the revaluation surplus may be transferred to retained earning at the disposal of the asset. So once you are done with the asset, if there's any revaluation, you can close it to retained earning, whether it's um, a loss or a gain. Revalued asset must be presented either at the gross amount, less separately reported accumulated depreciation, or at a net amount. So you could either show the asset minus depreciation, or you could just show the net amount. You can show the net amount. Fair value and frequency of revaluation. So how do you determine the fair value? How the fair value is determined? And that's a lot of work, okay? And how often do you have to do so? Well, the fair, what's, first of all, what is the fair value of an asset? Well, the fair value is how much you can b get for this asset on that date between willing parties in an arm length transaction. So the fair value is how much can you sell this asset for to somebody, to an outsider, to somebody that you're not related, you, you're related to, they're willing to pay for it. This is what the fair value is. And the fair value of the asset at the date of the revaluation. So when you do this revaluation, how much it's worth. Now, if you have a, a land and building, you have to maybe hire a qualified appraiser. They will appraise it for you. Uh, land and building. If you have plant and equipment, it's also determined also through some sort of some sort of appraisal if you have plant and equipment. Now, sometimes you might have very specialized equipment that's 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 very unique to your business very unique to your industry nobody has a similar asset which is it's very common in manufacturing then what you have to do you have to use a depreciated cost cost depreciated replacement cost approach so you just have to look at it from a book perspective how much it lost depreciation and if you want to recover that depreciation buy a new asset how much would it cost you okay if you want to kind of re replace that depreciation um, but most of the time you could always find the fair value even the fair value is difficult to uh, uh, to obtain and costly to obtain and time consuming think about if a company is revaluing its property plant and equipment every year that's a lot of work a lot of work for appraisers as well appraisers would love you because they, every time they do this they're going to charge you they're going to charge you money for it but it's not it's not um, it's not feasible okay in my opinion i'm i'm, I'm us gap biased um, revalue amount should not differ materially from the fair value at the balance sheet. So when you revalue it, it should be closer to the fair value. 
okay what's what's that gonna do it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna basically pushes push you to keep revaluing your asset because you want to keep it at fair value okay now although IASP avoids annual revaluation in some circumstances they will be necessary to comply with the standard because remember the standard says when you list that asset if you if you chose the revaluation it has to reflect fair value therefore you might have to do it every year in some cases the fair value doesn't change a lot from year to year then you could only do the revaluation every several years but remember once you open that pandora box and you decided to revalue revalue your asset you're going to have to do it on a regular basis maybe yearly maybe not depending on the change in that asset so what happened to accumulated depreciation when you revalue the asset what do you have to do because once the asset is revalued maybe you bought it at a hundred thousand now it's at 130 or maybe down it's at 70 so what do you have to do with the depreciation well you, you have two options you can restate the accumulated depreciation proportionally with the change in the gross amount of the asset so what's going to happen the gross amount of the asset the asset will change the gross amount the gross carrying amount of the asset if your book value is changing so then you have to change the depreciation proportionally so that the carrying amount of the asset after the revaluation equal to the revalued amount so basically what you have to do you have to say well if my carrying amount is changing well I have to change my accumulated depreciation proportionally okay so the standard uh, the standard comment that this method is often used where the asset revalued by the mean of an index and is appropriate method for those comp companies using current cost accounting so this method is appropriate when you're using current cost accounting the other way to do it is to eliminate the accumulated depreciation against the, gro the gross carrying amount of the asset and restate the net amount of the revalued amount of the asset well, what, what are we talking about here well the best way to kind of show you both method you could read them is to work an example that's the only way to show you how you know alternative one versus alternative two how would that work so let's take a look at an example let's assume K company has a building with a cost of a million accumulated depreciation of 600,000 book value or carrying value equal to 400,000 which is a million minus 600 as of December 31st year one so this is where we stand so on this date the company determined that the fair value for this building is 750 hold on a second I have an asset on the books this is the book value is 400,000 and when you're telling me is my value should be 750 what does that mean it means I have to write up my asset 350,000 okay so the company wishes to carry the building at the revalued amount and the revalued amount is 750 okay so let's take a look at treatment one okay let's go let's look at treatment one one more time so you have to restate the accumulated depreciation proportionally with the change in the gross carrying amount of the asset so that the carrying amount the book value of the asset after the valuation equal to the revalued amount so let's take a look at what we are talking about here okay under alternative one, company at uh, company K would restate both the building and accumulated depreciation, such as the ratio of net the carrying amount is forty percent. Now, why forty percent? Because the value, the book value is four hundred thousand divided by the original cost is forty percent. So the book value is forty percent. Now the carrying value is seven fifty. Now the new value is seven fifty. What does that mean? It means to find my new in quote cost okay my new cost I'm gonna have to take 750 divided by 40 percent let's do this I'm gonna take 750 divided by 0.4 so my asset my, the new value of my asset it was a million dollar at, at the original cost now I should consider my asset at 1 million eight hundred and seventy five thousand okay and the book value should be 40 percent of this well well again doing the same thing the book value is 40 percent which means it's 750 well well if my asset should have a cost of 1750 and book value of 750 well can I find my accumulated depreciation sure I can find it remember cost minus accumulated depreciation equal to the book value so accumulated depreciation will be 1 million 125 let's take a look at this so this is the original this is the original information cost 
gross amount at um, you know, gross carrying amount minus accumulated depreciation equal to the book value. Then we said the the gross carrying amount goes to from a million to one million eight hundred and seventy-five. Now, how did I figure this number out? Well, I said the the new book value should be uh, the new carrying amount should be seven fifty, and seven fifty should be forty percent of the carrying amount. So I took 750 divided by 40%. So my new carrying amount should be 1,875,000. And my new book value is going to go from 400,000 to 750. This is the fair value. I have to list it at fair values. I have to have an increase of 350. Well, if I have to increase of 350 to go from a million to million 875, I have to add 875. And my accumulated depreciation will have to increase by 525 because I need a fair value of 750. So basically, taking this information, I can book an entry. I can debit my building, 875, credit accumulated depreciation, increase accumulated depreciation by 525, and now I have a revaluation surplus of 350. So that's the entry to accomplish this. So let's take a look at the second alternative treatment. Okay, let's take a look at the rule first before we look at it. Eliminate the accumulated depreciation against the gross carrying amount of the asset, then restate the net amount to revalued amount of the asset. So first, remove the old depreciation against the gross amount. So the old depreciation is 600,000. I'm going to debit accumulated depreciation, reduce accumulated depreciation, 600,000, and I'm going to do it against the carrying amount of the building. So I remove the depreciation and accumulated depreciation, the old one, and remove the building. Again, remove it against the building. Then I'm going to restate, then it says, then the building account is increased by 350. Then I have to increase now the, my building by 350, and I'm going to have to book a revaluation re surplus. Then I increase my building by 350. So notice, as a result of these two entries, the building account has a carrying value of 750. The original value is a million. I removed 600,000 in the first entry. Then I added, then I added 350. Then I added 350. Okay. So as a result, the carrying amount is 750 under both under both scenarios. So those are the two alternative. That's that's how you have to deal with depreciation. Okay. So what's going to happen is. When we have that, that revaluation in year one, that's pretty straightforward. But what happens when you have revaluation subsequent to year one? So you have an asset, you value it up year one, then in year two it went down. Well, how far did it go down? Did it go down to the original cost or did it fall below the cost? Or you had an asset and it went down below the cost, then it went up above cost. So how do you have to do in subsequent years? So year one is pretty, is pretty straightforward. On the first evaluation, after the initial recording, the treatment of increases and decreases and the carrying amount is pretty straightforward. And that is, increase are credited directly to the very revaluation surplus. So any increase goes into OCI, which is part of equity. Any decrease in year one goes as to the income statement. So year one, it means basically you have an asset, you have the cost, and here's what happened. If you have to revalue it down in year one, that's an expense. If you have to revalue it up, it's an, o an OCI. That's year one. Now what happened in year two? When year two, maybe your asset went up here. Maybe your asset is down here. But what do you have to do after year two? Well, it's still, I, I believe it's still pretty straightforward in my opinion. To the extent that the, that the previous revaluation surplus to the extent that there is a previous revaluation surplus with respect to an asset, a decrease should be charged against it first that any excess of deficit over the previous surplus should be expensed. In simple English, you have the cost here. In year one, you revalue the asset right here. Year one. So as long as the asset value is in this area above the cost, you are still dealing with OCI. That's what we're saying. If the revaluation falls below the cost, if, ha if it happens to fall here, then this amount will be OCI and this amount will be expense. To the extent that the previous to the extent that the previous revaluation resulted in a charge to an expense, 
A subsequent upward revaluation first should be recognized as income to the extent of the previous expense, and any excess should be credited to the other comprehensive income. AKA, let's let's do it. Let's do it in simple example. This is my cost. And year one, I, I went below my cost. When I went below my cost, it was an expense. Now I went from this expense, I went I went down ten thousand. Then I went up only 5,000. Well, as long as I'm dealing below cost, this is gonna be an income of 5,000. But let's assume I went from negative 10,000, negative 10,000 to positive 3,000. Now, positive 3,000. Well, guess what? I have 10,000 of income and 3,000 goes into OCI. So again, the same concept. Any Anytime you are dealing below the line and the line is cost, anytime you are dealing below the line, you are dealing in OCI. I'm sorry, below the line, below cost, you are dealing with expenses and income. If it went up, it's an income. If it kept on deteriorating, it's an expense. Once that value goes above cost, then you are dealing with OCI. That's basically it. Okay, and the best way to look at this is to actually work an example to see how this works. So we have three assets, a land, a building, a building, and a machinery. So we're gonna work each one of them separately. Let's start with land. Land had a cost of 100,000. It went up to 120, then it went up to 150. So we bought it, the cost is 100. It went up to 120, it went up to 150. So it went up, then it went up again. So let's take a look at the journal entry. The first year we debit land at 20, then we credit revaluation surplus, up and up. Revaluation surplus, remember, it's an OCI account because it's above, above the cost. Year two, again, we debit land 30,000, we debit revaluation surplus. Again, we're dealing above 100,000, pretty straightforward. The building went down from 500 to 450. Then in year two, went from 450 to 460. So it fell below the cost year one, then year two it recovered, but it's still below the cost. So let's take a look at what we do now. We debit loss on revaluation, which is an expense, 50,000, and this is year one. Then we credit the building, 50,000. In year two, we we're still at a loss, but we recover 10,000. We debit the building 10,000, and we credit revaluation surplus, which is an income account, 10,000. Why? Because we are dealing below 500 million. Machinery went from 200 to 210, which is good. It went up in value, then from, went from 210 to 185. Then in the following year, it dropped below the original cost. So year one is pretty straightforward. I bring the asset up 10,000, and I bring the my revaluation surplus up 10,000. In year two, what happened is this. So this is what we are dealing with here. This was the this was the this is the line. So year one, I was up here 210. If I'm up here, I'm dealing with OCI. So I book this into I book this into OCI. Year two, sorry, year two, I went from I went from 200,000 to 185. So now I'm gonna have to remove my OCI, I have to debit my OCI, my revaluation surplus, reduce my building, my machinery by 25, and book an expense by 15. So this is the 15, it's an expense, and this is the 10 is OCI. This is the 10,000, so this is OCI, and this is an expense, okay? So what happened to the valuation surplus account, okay? You remember, the valuation surplus are an equity. Well, revaluation surplus and equity might be transferred to retained earning when the surplus is realized. What does it realize? It means kind of we stop using the asset. When do we stop using the asset? We either sold it, exchange it, or simply stop using it, okay? Realized either through the use of the asset or upon its sale or disposal. The revaluation surplus and equity may be transferred in one, uh, one and one of two ways to retain earning. So we may go through a lump sum at the time of the asset sold us or scrap, just take it, take it out, or within each period, an amount equal to the difference between the depreciation on the revalued amount and the depreciation on the historical amount of the asset might be transferred and retained earnings. So might we do it in pieces or we might do it all in lump sum when we sell the asset. And guess what? There's a third possibility that's allowed by IFRS is do nothing with the surplus with the revaluation surplus. 
And I'm assuming this third option is do nothing is because sometimes you're going to have gains, you're going to have losses. They basically they offset each other over the long over the long term. It may not it may not be true. It may not be true. Okay. Let's talk about depreciation because depreciation is a major component of property, plant, and equipment. The depreciation for IFRS or IAS 16 is the same, similar to US GAAP. It's based on the estimated life and there's a residual value if, if there is one. The depreciation method, this is basically the rule, which is very general, generous general rule, just like US GAAP. The depreciation method should reflect the pattern in which the asset future economic benefit are expected to be consumed. So how are you going to consume this asset? use the depreciation. Now, straight line may not always be appropriate, but they're pretty flexible. If you think this asset's gonna serve you equally, use the straight line. If you think you're gonna use it more early in its life, use maybe the, some sort of a uh, 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 cost recovery system that is, uh, that's accelerated, an accelerated cost recovery system. Uh, treat any changes prospectively. What does that mean? It means there's any changes in depreciation, the life of the asset, you change the life of the asset, you change its residual value. You don't have to go back and change any prior period, just like take this asset and make the change and look in the, into the future prospectively. Now, again, if you don't know how depreciation works, well, you can go to my, you guessed it, intermediate accounting, okay? But there's something in an IFRS that we don't have in US GAAP, and that is called component depreciation. Now, this is different. Component depreciation is something that we don't have in IFRS, okay? So, when an item of pp &E is comprised of significant part for which different depreciation method or useful life are appropriate, each must be depreciated separately. Uh, in simple English, what does that mean? Um, when the item, so we, we might have one item, but that item is, it has sub subcomponents, subcomponent. Well, guess what? then you can take each asset within that sub, so you can, rather than looking at the asset itself, one asset, you could take the asset and take it as subcomponent and deal with it separately. And this is what we mean by, this is what we mean by uh, depreciated separately. Component can be physical, such as aircraft engine, or non-physical, such as major inspection. Now, just FYI, component depreciation, it's not commonly used under US GAAP. So that's really a, a special IFRS rule, but let's take a look at an example, pretty straightforward. I think we have something similar in US GAAP. We don't call it component depreciation. We call it asset segregation. It's similar, but not the same. So I'm, I'm just gonna say similar, but not the same. Okay, and I know this because what I used to work in my uh, public accounting firm, we used to specialize in asset segregation, and I believe it's the closest thing to component depreciation. But to look at component depreciation, how it all fits, let's work an example. Um, so Air Canada, it's, so this is the quote from Air Canada annual report. So the corporation allocate the amount initially recognized in respect to an item of property, brand, and equipment to its significant component and depreciate them separately. So they use this method. So let's just like take a look at an example and see how this method works in the real world. Suppose on January 1st, year one, Air Canada acquired a piece of baggage handling machine with an estimated useful life of 10 years for 120,000. So they bought, and that's pretty straightforward. If you ever travel, there's baggage handling machinery, okay? And you're hoping you're gonna find your luggage there. And they paid 120,000 for it. Now here's how it works. They looked at the asset and they find out the machine has an electrical motor that must be replaced every five years. What they said is the electrical motor is, is a separate component okay then the whole machine and it's estimated a cost of ten thousand dollar to replace so they have a ten thousand dollar to replace so basically the electrical motor is worth ten thousand dollars that's what we're saying here so it's a separate asset in addition by law the machine must be inspected every two years now the inspection cost is two thousand under ifrs inspection cost if it's mandated it's considered kind of a part of the asset so how are we going to depreciate the asset we're, we're going to have three assets here we're going to have the motor we're gonna have the inspection and we're gonna have the machine itself. The motor has a cost of 10,000, useful life of 10 years, depreciation is $2,000 per year. So, so we'll depreciate the motor separately. The inspection is 2,000, the useful life is two years. Therefore, the inspection, we're gonna have depreciation of 1,000 for year one for two years. The machine, what's left, because remember 120, we allocated eight, uh, 10,000 to the motor, 2,000 to the inspection. We are left with 108, and this is going to be a 10 year machine, 10,800, therefore year one, 13,800. What we did is we took the asset and we decomposed it. Once again, 
something similar in concept we have what's called asset segregation under US GAAP okay I believe the last topic we're gonna look at and explain is the called the recognition and what is the recognition it's the the removal of an asset or a liability from a, from a balance sheet just like the opposite of recognition let me just my pen is not working now so what is recognition recognition is when you put something when, is when you put something on the balance sheet recognition the recognition D is the kind of the opposite when you remove it from the balance sheet so the carrying amount of an item must be recognized so you de de recognize take it out when you dispose of it you sell it you exchange it or when there's no future economic benefit are expected from its use so just basically you're no longer using it and you need to take it out okay any gain or loss arising from the derecognition of an item is included in net income and we talked about that if we did an exchange earlier okay now if we dispose of it as long as we get more than the book value we have a gain if we have less than the book value we have a loss when it comes to that derecognition again if you're interested in this selling an asset go to my intermediate accounting course okay now once an asset is derecognized what does that mean it means we remove we took it out of property plant and equipment it should be reclassified as non-current asset held for sale so once it's no longer an operation, it cannot be placed with PP&E because it's no longer PP&E. Now it's considered, in a sense, held for sale. It's some sort of an, not an investment, but it's, it's an asset held for sale. It's not inventory. It's not an investment. It's just an asset held for sale. Okay? So IFRS 5 now will will apply to it non-current asset held for sale and discounted operation provide guidance with respect to the accounting treatment for non-current asset okay and so we're now we're dealing with I, I ifrs 5 once the asset is held for held for sale okay i might work an example or two or three about property plan and equipment just to expose you a little bit more to the topic if you have any questions, any comments, please email me. If you happen to visit my website for additional lectures, please consider donating. Good luck.